has been an interesting semester so far. We've heard from a lot of people with a lot of success, and um, one thing that's been interesting is that we've heard from people who are looking back on their success, whether that's Tony Shu from DoorDash, or Stephen Lamb from GoGoVan, or last week's speaker Adam Shire from Siri, and tonight we are actually in for a treat. Um, because our speaker is in the middle of the trenches right now as she does her startup. Um, today's speaker yeah. is a Cal grad. Yeah. She's a mechanical engineer, although I'm, I'm told that's actually now a roboticist. So I'm curious, who in the audience would also consider themselves a roboticist? Oh, we have two who are willing to say they are. Maybe three, I like it. Um, went on to get her master's at MIT. And then post-graduation, her resume, to me at least, and probably to you all, reads like a dream. She's held leadership positions in some of the most renowned global brands, whether that's McKinsey, Khan Academy, Pixar, LinkedIn. And um, a little over a year ago, she launched her startup, Tribe AI. Tribe is focused on building technology to help everyone get a fair shot at professional success. Tribe takes on career coaching, team functionality, inclusion, diversity, and uses data to maximize performance. So please start thinking about your own questions on career, data, startups, pivots, as we begin our chat. And welcome Naomi Davidson of Tribe. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so uh, I thought it might be interesting to wake everybody up tonight to start with a little bit of true confessions. Okay. So you're on paper, you're LinkedIn also, it just reads like a dream. It's incredible. It looks like one thing just flowed into the other as if you planned it all out. Um, but I think that might not be the case and I was wondering if you would be willing to share a little bit about your background with us. Yeah, absolutely. And is my mic on? Yeah. You can hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, I have. I, I thank you. I, I definitely feel like I've had um, been extremely fortunate to work at some of the most exciting uh, and um, you know just really incredible companies in the United States and, and globally, and uh, extraordinarily thankful for that. For me, like so many of you, probably, uh, I didn't come uh, into Berkeley with a um, uh, with a background that was like what I thought was typical of successful people. Um, for me, uh, you know, like I know, I think Jill was telling me that 30% of Cal grads are, um, you know, this is, they're the first person, in, first generation students, and for them, they're on a journey that this is like the first time that, that they've had a chance in their family to get an opportunity to really take advantage of what uh, an education at UC Berkeley can do for you. Uh, for me, I was, um, I'd grown up in a home that was, um, you know, you might call it uh, at risk. We were unstable. My parents loved me, but they were poor. Um, and the environment that we grew up in was just, frankly, not the kind of environment that um, was where we had a lot, we had a lot of food on the table, had a lot of resources. And so um, by the age of 16, I was actually already on, living on my own, and I was homeless uh, in Toronto. And I didn't think I was going to graduate from high school, and in fact, I didn't. And I never imagined that I would go on to studying anything um, at UC Berkeley or otherwise. But um, what I ended up discovering along the way, and the way that I found myself here, is that I, um, I started learning to learn. And the first time that started happening to me was when I was uh, traveling in Venezuela, and I just started getting fascinated with studying Spanish. And um, found that really fun and started to go to, uh, when I got back from being in Venezuela, I decided I'd go to communi community college. Uh, it used to be really close by, it's called Laney and Vista. Um, I went to community college to study Spanish and I, again, I had no idea that that would take me down a path that would get me into Cal and that would get me into, Ber into MIT and that would get me into, into McKinsey and the rest was basically history for me because uh, once you're able to tr start traversing a path like that, you start being able to really write your own ticket and that's what I started learning how to do. Um, and at the core of that was um, when I started studying Spanish, it was so fun, it just became the next 
the next risk I would take, and the next risk I would take was math, uh, because I thought I sucked at math, uh, as so many people think they suck at math. And then I decided that even though I felt like I sucked at math, that I wasn't going to quit math until somebody kicked me out. And um, I was certain that somebody at some point was going to kick me out, uh, but they never did, and uh, managed to get into UC Berkeley um, by just basically working, uh, you know, it's not pretty, I worked my ass off. I would usually have two to three jobs at a time, um, and I I just would not let go until I got where I wanted to be. And uh, that was studying robotics um, here at Berkeley. And that's where I learned some of the, um, the, the thinking. You know, they always tell you when you go to school, you learn the art of thinking and reasoning. And it was really the, um, what I learned in, me in mechatronics and controls theory uh, that I continue to apply to pretty much every tough business problem I ever get served today and uh, used to do um, uh, a lot of the really advanced thinking that I do, and it's really what's gotten me a lot of the success I've had. What, are, um, not having taken mechatronics, what were those things that you learned? Well, it's funny because in the world of business, um, people are always talking about closing the loop, and people who take, I see, the one roboticist is smiling, you know what we're talking about. Um, so the idea is like you take an input signal and you apply a bunch of um, math to it to be able to sort of predict what's the output that you want to get after you've put that signal through some kind of sensor. So you like, you want something, you want an actuator to move from here to there, and it's in space and you don't know what's happening, so you basically, you, you apply a sensor and you read something, and you, this, you could give a much better description of what this is now. But it's the idea that you can um, use some math to tune a signal to get some, some piece of unknown information that you have some very little uh, insight about to get a final result that you're aiming for. And, and what's, what's really interesting, at least about robotics from my angle, is you're always dealing with these really messy and perfect systems because I was always trying to build in unstable environments like walking and swimming robotics. So you never have enough sensors and you never know enough of what you need to know to really know what the answer is. And so you have to deal with all this messiness of the world and uh, try to make a prediction based on that. And that's what control theory is all about. And so that's like the really, um, you know, kind of like complicated way of saying it. But in the world of business, if you understand that, you know, like basically I want growth and it's a really messy market out there and there's all this stuff and it's really imperfect data and I have no way of knowing everything that's going to go on, but I know what signal I'm aiming for and I know what results I'm aiming for and I know how to take in a lot of really messy information um, and stay on target. That's essentially what I think of myself as doing, uh, you know, with a lot of different business problems. So. What happened that you left Cal and then went to MIT other than oh, yeah. graduating? Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and did, actually, did you graduate from high school or somehow? No, I never did. I okay. never did. I never got my GT and I never graduated from high school. Um, yeah, so that, apparently you can do that. Apparently, I didn't know that that's something you can do, but you can. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's not necessarily the, the ideal path. Uh, but um, the question is, why did, how did I get to? Yeah, then, um, then how did you continue to study at MIT? Yeah. Um, well, the, uh, I was really, really lucky. I had a friend in school. I, my confidence was actually pretty low at that time still. And I had this great friend who um, she, she basically taught me grit. Um, and what she basically showed me was she was this A student and she killed every class. And what I noticed she did, which was really news to me, is she just worked really hard. She studied, she applied herself. To me, I thought that like basically if you weren't, and if you guys are familiar with grit and growth mindset, I was a classic fixed mindset. I thought that only, um, you only really had a right to be there if you were really smart and you knew it from the beginning. And what she taught me was, no, you get to learn it and you get to practice and you get to try and you get to make mistakes. Um, and when I was thinking of finishing um, my bachelor's, she basically said to me, Naomi, you gotta apply it, you gotta apply it to MIT. And I was like, no, there's no way in the world I'm getting in there. And she's like, well, what have you got to lose? And um, I realized she was right. What did I have to lose? So I did the thing of applying to the schools I thought I'd never get into um, and just about died when I opened up the letter. Um, for me, and I'll just be honest, I, again, I didn't have the best grades, I didn't get the best score on my graduate um, entrance exams, but I did work in a lab in, uh, at um, Berkeley with an incredible professor, um, Homer K. 
has Ernie. Um, and, uh, and I got an opportunity to uh, basically do what I'm good at, which is more project type work and pursuing a complex problem um, and not being daunted by that. So I basically leveraged that skill to get into MIT because yep. he was a, an MIT alum and he wrote a great recommendation for me. That's fantastic. And then, so you've had, I mean, I want to get to starting your company, but it is interesting. You've gone to all these different places. Um, McKenzie, I mean, I, I didn't, I thought basically they got 90% of their new hires from business schools. Yeah. How do. did McKenzie happen? Yeah. And McKenzie's a, um, management one consulting. of the top, if not the top management consulting company worldwide. And I, at least, Ages ago, last century, when I was in school, it was like that was the interview that you wanted was McKinsey. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was. Um, I like you. Whatever happened to you in the last six to twelve months that made you think, "Hey, I'm curious about entrepreneurialism." That happened to me at MIT when I entered MIT's 100K competition, and I thought, "Wow, this is really cool." And it made me realize I didn't want to go and get my PhD. Uh, my professor was asking me to do that, and I realized that I, what I wanted to do was go out and build things, go out in the world. Like I like to build robots. I like to make things work. I like to, you know, when I turn it on, it goes boom, and something happens, and so. So um, I was sure that I needed, I felt sure that I needed some business acumen, and the best place to get that was McKinsey. And so again, I used my sweat and my grit to, uh, to basically just work really hard practicing for those interviews and uh, managed to get a job there. And what I thought of it as was a lab for a, pr a practical applied MBA because I, was, I felt like, you know, if I want to learn this stuff, at least for me, I felt like I'd been in school enough at that point, and I wanted to get out and get really practical uh, about things uh, because I was getting hungry to see results. And um, oh, that's all right. I'm, you got that? Obviously. <laughs> um, and so that's how I went on to McKinsey. And it was at McKinsey, and I think this was really like just when I was. Um, have you guys heard the really famous Steve Jobs graduation speech where he says, stay hungry, stay foolish? Just when I was finishing uh, MIT, I was lucky enough to hear that graduation speech and it really stuck for me. So when he said, you know, it'll make sense in 2020, do you guys, does that, how many of you guys have heard that thing? Just a few? Okay, so basically Steve Jobs gives like one of the most um, inspiring, if you haven't seen it already, you really should. It's one of the most inspiring uh, talks that I've ever heard about how you really um, follow your passion in an intelligent way to achieve success in your life. And he said one of the things, he, he basically he um, audited all these courses on calligraphy, and that ended up being, obviously, in so many ways, how the Mac took over from, um, from Microsoft on word processing, right? Um, anyway, so he tells this amazing, brilliant story, and I was like, I was really struck by that. And um, when I went into uh, McKinsey, I basically felt like I'm just following my passion here. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to learn business in order to do that. I'm going to go and do the next thing, and I'm going to try to do it in the best place I know how or know where to do that. And uh, for me at the time, it was McKinsey. I actually think you guys live in a time where that could be a startup. That could be, I mean, Silicon, you're right next to Silicon Valley. It's probably um, an even more exciting place to go and get your uh, business acumen. Um, but basically, I was pursuing the um, pursuing the learning I felt I needed um, to to have the success that I wanted and uh, and I basically what I learned there ended up being one of the first major steps I would later realize in my my path to tribe.ai and what I basically learned there um, was what I always thought was this magical thing and um, it turns out that I don't think it's quite as magical as um, many people think. And it's really just um, what, what are the core skills of leadership? What makes some people able to lead in really um, tough circumstances, hard problems, uh, big teams, you know, take people through, uh, you know, from A to Z, you know, on, uh, you know, leading a rocket ship. It's a hard thing to do. And what, what makes some people so amazing at it? And that's where I first got my exposure to that. And that really was, um, for me, that a kind of eye-opening moment of what I'm really passionate about doing and the problem I want to fix. So how long were you at McKinsey? I was there four years. And then what made you then leave McKinsey and go to your next position? 
<laughs> well, um, I don't know if any of you guys have done uh, consulting, but the consulting lifestyle is brutal. Um, I would, I mean, you just, you don't sleep much, you travel all the time. I lived here in Berkeley and I probably spent, I don't know, four or five weekends a year at home. And um, I, I basically decided once I got there that I just wanted to pick up these leadership skills. So as soon as I, tr I got to the point that I wanted to be uh, for my personal career growth, I left and I went to Pixar um, because it's so creative and, um, you know, creativity incorporated essentially. And I really felt that uh, those were the kinds of products that I wanted to make. And I thought it was a small enough company and a creative enough company that I would have an opportunity to do something interesting there. Um, so I basically sold myself. I had no experience doing finance or anything related to mo movies. And I basically said, um, yeah, but I, I know how to do this other kind of math and this other kind of uh, problem solving. And so I can help you with your movies. And uh, they basically thought I was a big enough nerd to try and um, gave me an opportunity to, to um, help them produce movies. So it seems like you developed grit early on. Then you started uh, with your growth mindset uh, when you're at in school and using that to work in the lab when you're at MIT, and then realizing that you had this affinity for project work, but also being an entrepreneur and building stuff, going to McKinsey and learning about leadership, and then going to Pixar and figuring out creatively how to solve problems as well. Yeah. And then yeah. you use that in I think at that time, a smaller company. Yeah, I went to Khan Academy. So for me, and I don't know if you have this, but I didn't feel like I had the risk profile. I remember saying this, even at McKinsey. Um, it, you'll hear this a lot from consultants that we're, I'm kind of risk averse. And, um, you know, I had, I wanted to take care of my family, as I mentioned, that we're not very well off. So I wanted to make sure that I was taking care of them. Uh, I wanted to, um, you know, uh, make sure that uh, I wasn't poor again, right? So I had these things. I was like, I don't want to just take these huge risks and jump out and start a company. So I was pursuing these companies that I thought would be really cool places to work that felt entrepreneurial, that felt creative. And uh, so that's why I thought Pixar would be great. And it's great, but it's not entrepreneurial. Um, not what I thought. It wasn't like this, uh, you know, there's a lot of creativity, but it's in the story and it's in the art and it's in the craft and it's not in the kind of problems that I love to solve, which is what do we do next? And why do we do that? And why are we going over here? And why are we building this thing? And so, you know, really building the company itself from scratch is something that I love to do. Um, plus, plus so it takes a long time. It it's like you start building five and years, five yeah. years later a movie comes out. Yeah, it's a painstaking process. It's very patience oriented and I didn't realize how. Just out of curiosity. So when we see those credits on the Pixar movies, where's your name? Um, Which movies? Yeah, so it's Brave. Um, my name comes right after the actors. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was very, for me, the first time I saw my name there. I, and literally when they were showing the credits, I was like, you guys forgot me. Where am I? Uh, and then, you know, I see my name right after the, the actors. And I literally started like screeching in like dog tones. Like nobody could understand. I was like, what? <laughs> That's why my name is. Um, so uh, yeah, but it was really an honor to be able to work on it. was the first movie I worked on was an Oscar winning movie. And I mean, it's just like, wow. I mean, you know, you can't help but feel like, how did that happen? Um, and I'll just tell you, like that only happens by um, daring and having grit and just not giving up. And um, and that's, I mean, I left there because I realized this wasn't, even though it felt like, you know, it's and Pixar, it's so cool, and the movies are beautiful, but I wasn't working on the thing that I wanted to work on, so I went to Khan Academy. Um, trying to help college students um, change out, try to change outcomes at a national scale uh, using the basically educational disruption and technology that um, Khan Academy was building. And it felt like this was going to be a perfect fit because it was a startup and because uh, they were doing something that I cared deeply about, which was helping other people get into college and be able to change their trajectory as well. Um, and so I dove into that and um, at how, how many people were there when you started? It was 40 people, so it was it was a decent size, you know. So when you went to interview there, did you talk to Solomon? Did you? Yeah, yeah, Sol and um, several, yeah, it was a small enough company that you worked really closely with everyone. Um, yeah, you can imagine we're all in one huge room. <laughs> I assume, have you all used Khan Academy? 
Is there anybody here who has not used Khan Academy? Two people. I like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a pretty incredible technology, and what they're doing is uh, is really changing outcomes for people in the U.S. And once once I was doing that for uh, college students, and I'll I'll say something that might be controversial, and I I don't mean to offend the wonderful institution that we're a part of here, um, but change is slow in the world of higher education. And um, there's something about me, like five years is slow, so tens or 20 years of waiting for change would be um, really slow for me in the world of higher education. Um, and I realized that the world where I really wanted to make a difference was in the professional world. Kind of goes back to that moment at McKinsey when I realized, for me, learning to lead, the soft skill, quote unquote, of learning to lead, those were the game-changing skills that I learned. I've been, every change I've made in my career has been because I've learned how to leverage the skills, um, especially apply the problem solving I learned at, at Berkeley and the leadership skills that I gained at McKinsey. And when you put those two things together, you have this really powerful combination. And I realized like, hey, I mean, you guys all, we all, we're all a lot more familiar with how you learn the hard skills and I really wanted to focus on how you build those soft skills and how can we use technology and AI to help people do that, um, to help make those soft skills feel more tangible. And uh, so that's what we're doing at Tribe. So when you were at Khan Academy, did you, had, did you start thinking about Tribe? Had yeah. you, was that already in the back of your mind? Yeah, I was going to go and start Tribe then. Um, but I managed to, um, I did, again, risk aversion. I, I met the VP of sales ops at LinkedIn. And um, he basically uh, funded me like a startup within a startup. He thought I was onto something really interesting. And I basically incubated this idea in the sales environment there. Um, got it to a certain level of success. And um, I mean, we did certain things that you literally just don't do um, in terms of being able to change outcomes for salespeople. So I was working in the sales environment, which kind of goes back to closing the loop. Um, you can, in sales, you can see the outcomes really quickly. And the skills are complex skill sets, right? Negotiation, listening, um, thinking strategically about who you should talk to in an organization, navigating organizational complexity, all the things that a really uh, high-level salesperson needs to be able to do. So I was working on being able to, one, define those skills, two, um, work within a framework that would help other people build them quickly and measurably, and then three, see the business outcome in the form of higher, uh, higher revenue. And we showed that, which is uh, and in a statistically significant way, which was this huge deal. Uh, because you, it's such a noisy environment. There's so many people trying to affect that one thing. This is like where all the money lives in the business. So everybody's trying to. You have divisions of, there was a thousand people all in support of our 4,000 salespeople trying to help them make quota. And my little team of 15 people made a significant blip on the radar. And it was um, so noticeable that literally the head of sales was like, that's not possible. You have to go audit that group because there's no way they did that. And they actually found that we were, um, they, they repeated our results. So we're like, yay, <laughs> we're going to be embedded in the LinkedIn platform. This is great. We're all going to like, you know, like this is obviously the thing we have to do. Um, but the, at the time, uh, Microsoft had just bought LinkedIn. And so the, the, um, the, the focus of the company shifted, and it shifted to stabilizing, and this is a very common thing, you know, co companies go through these really, these arcs, and the arc that uh, LinkedIn was at when I was at the height of my, I'm ready to innovate, uh, they were at the height of the, hey, let's get everything under control, and make sure that we clamp down on all those new projects, and standardize as much as we possibly can, um, and so, I mean, those are very worthy, worthy things to do, but it's just, like kind of knowing where you are in your arc and what you love to do. Um, being able to innovate, uh, um, uh, Clayton Christensen has a beautiful talk on innovation and thinking about those different arcs. I'm hugely inspired by him. Uh, I am much more in that early phase. I love to build it from scratch. I like the zero to one part. And um, so I just realized, again, I don't have the patience to stick around. And at that point, I realized, why do I keep asking everybody else to help me figure this out and give me the um, give me the permission to do this. Why don't I just uh, figure it out myself? So I 
did the thing that you all will have to do. I like looked at my bank account. I figured out how many months I had. I figured out how much money do I think that I would put of my own to this. Um, I convinced a bunch of people that I really love uh, to follow me <laughs> into the great void. Um, and we, uh, we took off and built a company. Who, who, who did you convince to follow you? Um, well, let's see, I, I convinced the person who used to report to me, the person who um, basically when I came to LinkedIn, he heard the stories of what I was trying to do. It, like, it was all his favorite things, behavior design, um, product design, use of AI to help advance what people are capable of learning and understanding, understanding how to use that to affect cultural change and team effectiveness. So it was like, he felt like he was in heaven. And when we were working on that stuff together, I could tell he was um, sold on this idea Idea. So uh, he he jumped with me. Um, the um, the other thing uh, I met a guy on LinkedIn. Uh, he used to be a senior director of uh, software engineering at Oracle, and just the idea of being able to use he has a background of being an immigrant himself. So the idea that we could build technology to help make leadership development a more meritocratic process by making these soft skills more tangible, more clear. Um, and uh, he, was, he was thrown by this, so he jumped on board. Um, and then uh, our AI guy is actually, he's my husband. He's a um, PhD from MIT, and I've seen him do just extraordinary things with data. So uh, we formed this kind of core team, and the four of us have been the, the rock of Gibraltar. So, of the so when you started, we all hear about minim MVP, the minimal minimum viable product. What, what, I mean, it's pretty complex what you do. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you boiled it down for the lay person to say, this is when you started, not now, but when you yeah. started, what was the product? Yeah, well, you know, I'll be honest. I think MVP, much like, um, it's something you know in hindsight, it, I, I really believe, at least for us. I think it's easier to know, depends on, again, depends on the type of innovation, but if what you're building exists already, and you're making it that much more efficient, right? Um, then it's going to be a lot easier to be able to determine when you have an MVP. You know it because you've achieved a certain amount of uh, efficiency gain or less cost, uh, faster time to market, or you have very um, clear mar demarcations of what success looks like. When you're building a disruptive product that's completely new, what benchmarks do you have? How do you know when it is minimum? Uh, and the only way you know is by testing and, um, and by building and iterating. And there are moments where we were wildly wrong, and there are moments where we, are we were probably still wrong. I think we actually built um, not the minimum viable product, but a minimum viable platform. So what we thought was like the minimum pieces or elements of a singular um, functionality turned out to be a bed of functionality that will support um, a conversation between a coach, a leadership coach, and a person who's working on their leadership development. So what I mean by that is we see ourselves as being like a, a champ. We've had to adapt and um, really think about it. And it's, it's something that even right now we are in the crux of saying to ourselves, do we have it? And how are we going to know? Because people start wanting to buy it. And at least for me, I was just sharing this with Jill, my conversations with people are starting to shift where it sounds like I'm having this efficiency conversation. I, even though it's a really new product and they've never seen it before, I'm able to tell them, hey, if you use this thing, I'm sorry, if you use this thing, I can shave like 50% off the time it takes you to deliver your thing. I can multiply the amount of revenue that you get by X. And when you start to be in that kind of conversation and they understand very simply what you're doing, I think you're starting to be in an MVP situation. Can you describe how it works like what, uh, from a professional's perspective, somebody who's gone going into a company, how would you use Tribe? Yeah, yeah. Well, so there's two fundamental elements of learning, and it's really it, it's exactly like going to the gym. Uh, the way you train your muscles is very similar to the way you train your brain. Uh, so, like for example, you read a book, and um, you read a book that tells you, and this is one of the biggest skills leaders need to be great at: listen. Listen carefully to what the people are saying around you. If you listen to your team, um, you scale yourself, right? Because if you don't and you're directing them all the time, 
then your job, you, you basically do all the work for everyone. You micromanage manage everyone. Um, but it, even though that sounds really easy to do, it's extremely hard. Why is that? Because you have to give up control. You have to let them make mistakes that you're not comfortable with. There's a whole bunch of reasons why it's easy to say, very hard to do. So you read a book, and it tells you to do this thing, and they all say the same thing. But almost every leader struggles with this because it's just like going to the gym. It, it doesn't help you to lift up a dumbbell and know how heavy it is. You got to you got to train that muscle. Um, so we do the app. Basically, helps you uh, keep track. So you turn it on in a meeting. It helps you track things like talk time, use of questions, uh, type of language that you're uh, working on. For me, it's really important for me to be confident. It's really important for me to come into a sales conversation and speak with poise, grace, eloquence. I have this thing where I like to say we did everything all the time because I really like talking about we and our team and everything like, you know, and, and saying like and um. And so I, one, sound more junior, and two, um, I'm sort of giving away all of the ownership that I have over the ideas that I've built or created. And it's great when I'm working with the team, but it's not so great when I'm trying to say, hey, invest in me. Um, hey, buy this product because we, you know, we really know what we're doing. So I'll use Tribe to look for that self-deprecating language. When do I say, I think, when I, I know something? When do I say, um, uh, when do I ask something directly versus saying something indirectly? So use it to track language, um, and that's basically the feedback part uh, the, of practice, like get some feedback about how you're doing. The other thing is just to kind of use it as a journal to track your, basically track your fitness. So, um, hey, if I'm working on confidence, that's what I'm working on. If you're working on, um, uh, if you're working on not micromanaging your team, you know, that's what you would be working on. Maybe you pay attention to your talk time. Maybe you pay attention to the distribution of talk time of your team. Uh, and you set your goal to empower them to make decisions on their own. How, um, because this is something totally new, I mean, it, it kind of makes sense when you think about it. That would be important. And now we can track things. It was interesting. We had um, the gentleman who, who uh, started Siri, you know, can hear your voice and, and find things. How do you start to describe this then to people so that not only can you get those four core people on board, but then how do you, you were, you started talking about the efficiency mm -hmm. and how you sell it in. Like yeah. what is, who pays for it? Or I'm, I'm assuming people are paying for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, people are finally paying for it. Um, yes. Um, so, and, and by the way, it's not that old. It was just, I think it was May in 2017 yeah, that you that launched. I left. But I don't even know, yeah, but I don't even know when you put the website up. Yeah, I, well, I began, um, like I knew it was Tribe, uh, you know, because you have to design the business, right? What, what, what kind of business are we going to be? Are you going to try to be a hyper-growth business? Um, how disruptive is your product? What's the market for it? You know, all these kinds of things. So when I left, I didn't know exactly what the business looked like, but I knew that I wanted to start it, and I knew essentially what I was trying to sell. Um, and so it took us uh, at least till July to say, okay, it's called Tribe. It's an LLC. We're going to uh, tackle it in this way. Um, so the first year, uh, we, it took us, we, we had to build this thing. We, we were building something that was technologically hard to build. And we actually had to do a lot of, if you want to use AI, and um, how many people are doing something with AI right now? This is a good amount. OK. So I didn't want to be, build a product that was like true but useless. And there's a lot of true but useless stuff going on in AI right now. And what I mean by that is, if I, how do you bootstrap your product? If you bootstrap your product with like a lot of data, if I measure all of these people in this room and I try to say, what's your relative success and, um, you know, and what are the behaviors that I notice in you, but I have no idea what, what you're doing and what you're doing that's different. It's just this magic box of a bunch of data that I pushed in. I have no idea what exactly is going to predict that you're close to being a Jeff Bezos. I can just tell you, you're close to being a Jeff Bezos, and uh, you're not. And that's not helpful at all, right? That might be useful if you're a recruiter at LinkedIn, but it's not useful to you and me. So uh, what we wanted to be able to do is what I'd call the social physics of it, right? Be able to understand what are the dynamics of leadership so that we can measure them, and then we could actually tell you um, hey, you're really close to being an exceptional listener, and that is a core skill of some of the top leaders in your field, right? And this is where you are relative to So we had to do a lot of the science, and then we had to do a lot of some pretty hard engineering 
uh, just to pull together. I mean, voice is a platform. It is growing. It's a huge ladder, to, I mean, a huge wall to lean your ladder on, but it is like, we are pushing it at its absolute boundary of what it can do um, to, to get it to work in meetings and be able to give useful information to uh, leaders about their performance in a discussion. One thing that I'm quite interested in is the language around inclusion or diversity, because as a good leader, you need to pull that out of the team yeah. and make sure, when I think of inclusion, diversity, I don't mean just ethnicity, but um, types, you know, the type of yeah. personality or something like that. Yeah. I'm curious, how does Tribe measure that? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, again, this is some of the science that we feel like, for us, ground truth for a leader is how well is the team functioning, and we've studied teams. We actually went to MIT and Stanford and did some work about um, what are the dynamics of successful teams, right? Because it's the output that really for a leader. And the thing about um, uh, what, what the science of teams is, is finding, and there's a bunch of work at MIT, Stanford, and you know, Google, and a bunch of other places see, noticing that uh, one of the greatest predictors of a team's success is not the maximum IQ of any one individual but actually the ability for that team to um, share conversation time. And what they're really saying is that the collective intelligence of a team, if you can learn how to leverage that, that you, that's a more winning leadership strategy than looking for rock stars. So anyway, interesting to think about when you're thinking about recruiting for your teams and how you think about like basically the, um, the intellectual capital that you have on your team. And uh, so really what you're looking for is, and you know, in, in some ways, demographics and backgrounds are a proxy for this, but what you're really looking for is cognitive diversity. You're looking for people who solve problems differently than you, because basically, that makes you more creative, uh, it makes you able to solve more complex problem sets, and it helps you to solve them more quickly. When, so, you are, you appear to be goal-driven, but oddly, at the same time, like kind of very open to like, well, I think this is my goal, but we'll see where it goes. And you talked about really liking to build something. Yeah. Where are you in that path? Are you still in the building? And what's the next goal for you in terms of tribe? Yeah, um, we are definitely still building. So I think one of the things you were saying is like, what are some of the like real dirty, raw truths of like this, this stage of startup land? Um, if you like, if you like being able to do, uh, you know, thinking about like if you're if you're interested in entrepreneurialism, what the size of the startup is that you want to join, uh, when they're really in what is called the search phase, it is highly chaotic. It's really adventurous, um, and it is really exciting. I love it, uh, but it is like any one given day, and um, you know, we'll think about you know mimicking products or creating product experiences in the most creative way we possibly can so we can build things cheap and test them fast, right? Um, so at least me, on any given day, I'll be pretending that I'm some part of the product. So I am, you know, coding, I'm uh, building PowerPoints, I'm selling, I'm, uh, you know, I do, you do just about anything. Facilities, I'm the IT person often. So, uh, you know, really for me, it's a very, like, roll up your sleeves, do just about anything that it, you need or that it'll take to get it done. Um, and I've heard great stories, really inspiring stories, like of you know, CEOs of Zendesk and Airbnb knocking on doors. I mean, I'm not saying anything new, but if you like that and if you're willing to kind of like do what it takes and not quit, no matter kind of like what it's asking you to do, um, for me, I look at those as like really exciting learning opportunities, and they truly are. Uh, but for a lot of people who like to have a clearer role, um, it's a really uncomfortable uh, phase of the business. So you, you, said, you said earlier that you were kind of risk averse. So you can't help it, but when you start a company, it's a lot of risks. What do you do to minimize that risk for yourself? Yeah. Um, so for me, I, um, well, thankfully at, at McKinsey, I also learned a lot about strategic thinking. Um, so I think about what's the risk and how am I going to mitigate that and what's my plan B and what's my plan C and what's my plan D. Um, and uh, like I said, I try to be really practical. Um, I have a certain amount of uh, my own resources and time that I'm willing to give it. At the same time that I say that, I'm also not willing to let it go. Um, so even when I think about that, it's just sort of like, in what way will I invest if for some reason something doesn't go my way? I've heard stories, I heard a story the other day of a company that is nine years in without revenue. 
And um, another story, and I wish I could remember which one it is right now for you because it's a, it's a billion dollar company right now, but it took them 14 years to figure out what they were going to do. And obviously, they had to have jobs um, in that time. I'm pretty sure they weren't all just sort of independently wealthy. But it's that in, you know, unwillingness to let go uh, and to continue to solve the problem that you're, you're looking at. But um, that's how I manage it. I manage it by planning around it and rec recognizing that I, I, you know, I believe I can solve just about any problem if I put my mind to it. Um, it may not have exactly the outcome I want. But I can get myself through just about anything if I, especially when I have a powerful team with me, and I do. I have a really incredible team. Um, how big is the team now? Uh, yeah, we're still the core four. We use contractors to um, fuel like our growth and growth spurts and product. And until we're sure we've got product market fit, um, we're going to hold uh, because I'm not VC funded. I'm not trying to to go the VC funding route, um, so, which means bootstrapped. Yeah, You're so we're bootstrapped, and basically what I, and I I believe very strongly in that. Um, I have talked to a lot of VCs, and so I I make that decision by seeing how much work it takes to work with, you have a choice. You can spend the whole time trying to sell to VCs or you spend the whole time trying to sell to your customer. And I chose, I care more about the people I'm building for um, and the VCs are not the people that I'm building this product for. So I don't, I basically made a choice about who I want to spend my time with. Um, and I'll just be honest, as a female CEO uh, who has not been tested before, the amount of effort that I have to put in to be successful in those CEO conversations is big, right? It's not, you know, it's like 2% uh, investment rate in CEOs and, you know, uh, female CEOs. Uh, and so, you know, it's just sort of like, again, just doing the math. Like, I don't want to lament that or be, you know, hey, that's a big problem or something. If I thought that was the right way to go, I'd go that way. Uh, I just don't. I don't think that that VC community understands the problem that I'm trying to solve. They don't think, they don't lead teams. They don't think a lot about their leadership. Most of them did go to Ivy schools. Um, so this whole world is quite nebulous to them, and I don't think that they really understand the problem. Um, I would love it if you'd share a small success story, maybe, that, you, that you've had from the last six months. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I feel like right now, um, in the, in the last, like, you know, so <laughs> there was this moment where I basically, um, you know, we were struggling with the product. It didn't, you know, it seemed like we'd get it out, we'd make a shift, and we'd see a little uptick in our engagement, and then fall back down again, and then we'd change something else, and we'd see up, and then we'd go down, and we just couldn't get it to stick. And uh, so I really started saying to myself, like, the thing that you're supposed to do, not just, like, use my product like dog fooded. Um, or you know, drink your own champagne or whatever, but really use the product if I were trying to solve that, this problem for myself. If I were trying to be a better leader, how exactly would I use my product? And I just started using my product in this really new and different way. And that became a new product line um, that looks like it's gonna be our core product line. And um, the, I've got these um, coaches now who are so excited about it. I am suddenly in a position now where um, people are beating down my door to want to do joint ventureships and, uh, and partnerships and, and such. So um, it suddenly felt like the conversation shifted. And it shifted, I think, when I really stopped being so outwardly focused in a way of listening to everybody else. You know, it's like the, the Henry Ford thing. If you ask people, um, hey, you know, how should I innovate on, um, on locomotion? They'd say, you know, like faster horses uh, because they don't know what you're trying to build. Like you need, their, you need their insight, you need their feedback, but you really have to search inside. If you're building something new, you have to conceive of it. Um, and I think that moment of just really, really asking myself to hold my own feet to the flame and not let go until I was sure that I was getting the benefit that I wanted to see. When was my life changing? because um, I was using Tribe. And uh, it was great because I was doing this really hard thing of trying to be a CEO of this startup. And so it was kind of like meta where I was like, oh my god, I'm getting better at being a CEO of my own company at the same time that I'm building my own product. And um, that was kind of the moment where I was like, OK, I think, I think I'm on to something. Um, it is so fun to hear you talk and so fun to hear you getting so excited. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to hopefully have questions from the audience so um, about any of your path. And I know you'll you know, 
be pretty insightful in your answer. So I'm going to go ahead and shift to Travis and Swetha and, uh, and want to thank you initially. Thank you very, very much yeah. for talking to us and keep on talking to us. Oh, thank Thanks. you. My pleasure. We'll go ahead and... Uh, Wait. Uh, <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, so thank you for the, for the great conversation. I uh, just wanted to ask, so basically, given a little bit of your background in control theory and all that, so how do you see that applied a little bit to the tribe uh, idea? In a sense that, how do you see feedback coming back from the, the, the input that you can give to these leaders and how they can get better? So based on what you take in, like conversations and kinds of judgments that you can make with AI, what can you give back to them to like yeah. improve or change? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there absolutely is closing the feedback loop for yeah. the individual. Yeah, yeah. And then um, there's also in large part mm -hmm. I think about it for the organization. But I'll um, the, the business, for example, mm -hmm. that they're in. But I'll focus on um, on the individual. So um, it turns out like when you're when you're talking your ability to be aware of, um, like, especially as a leader, you're usually managing many, many things. So you're thinking about the problem you're trying to solve. You're thinking about the people in the room. You're thinking about um, you, who should be doing what. You know, you're, you're, you're thinking of a lot of different things. And so your awareness of how you're speaking may be very low. And so what I think about closing the loop for them is really just giving them the feedback um, of how am I doing with the thing I said I was going to do, which might be listening more asking more questions. Um, those are some of the real basic ones, the, the sort of top metrics that most of our leaders are focused on. So it's literally just surfacing that data back to them. Or one of the most popular ones right now is like fillers, like I just said. Um, ah, uh, increasing your presence by removing some of that um, fluff in your language. So it's just feeding the language back. When I think about it from an organizational standpoint, uh, it's the ability to say, hey, LinkedIn, you pay a lot of money for all of these leadership development courses and management skills. Your top performing leaders, they have these skills and we can actually measure that. And then when you invest in those skills, you should see a bump in things like um, time to market, cost to delivery, uh, employee engagement, retention. And so those are the, those are the outputs that we're aiming for. Um, you know, essentially, the, the ones that I care most about are retention and employee happiness. Okay, thank you so much for speaking today. Um, so my question is, when you were trying to solve a problem or trying to make space for creativity, what are some rules that you would use to govern your team or help your team move in the right direction? For creativity? Um, yeah. So, well, I love that question for two reasons because it's kind of, it, it's, I like that you're putting structure on creativity and it kind of assumes that, hey, you can create an environment that is um, more likely to induce creativity and one that isn't. A lot of people think of creativity as being sort of this magic thing. Um, again, kind of like leadership that you're either born with or you're not. But the reality is you can invest. So it turns out that one of the most important factors it, that teams need, um, and this is sort of a, a, a meta um, uh, metric, it's psychological safety, which is a fancy way of saying we feel valued and we feel like we belong, and we feel like if we make a mistake, it's not gonna be held against us, right? Because you have to feel safe to be creative, and when you give people an opportunity, um, when, you, when you create that psychological safety, which uh, the news is good that you can actually measure a lot of elements of psychological safety, or at least I think that's good that you can measure it, um, because that means that we can actually help people see and get feedback on whether or not it's happening. Uh, so that's the first thing that I know that you need. The second thing that I think you need is you need to give teams, um, you need to let teams grapple with problems. So when it gets messy and when it gets ugly, don't, you know, don't take it away. You know what I mean? It's sort of like the parent who gives the kid the, the drawing and when it gets really messy and ugly, they kind of pull it away and they're like, oh, well, let me sort of fix this for you, make it look nice and neat. That's actually the moment that um, being able to, to uh, get comfortable with the, um, the, the diffusion part of the process of creativity, when it things, feels like things are sort of getting broken to be brought back together. Um, and that, for a leader, that's just displaying confidence when things look tough. And just trusting in your team, that trust will go a long way because they'll follow you and they'll, um, they'll aim for solving problems that they might not normally aim for. 
Hi there. Oh, that's on. Okay, cool. Um, so I was wondering how you sized your market since it, to me, it seems that the value proposition of your product is like, you can see it, but it's an intangible basically. Yeah. So I was wondering how, how you, you size, size it because it seems kind of difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the ways I sized the market was how much do um, businesses spend on leadership and development now? And I happen to know that the, the spend that they, they make is all focused on two types of learning that, um, that there is measurable forgetting around. It's called the Hebinger forgetting curve, right? So you go to a workshop and you forget 70 to 80% of what happened and you walk away. So I know that they have at least a 70, 80% loss on the most expensive training they do. And uh, that's a $32 billion industry. And so, and it's only, it's been in double digit growth since like, 2013, I think I'm remembering that statistic correctly. Um, and, uh, and the reason why is actually because of you all. Um, so what's happening is that um, the baby boomer generation is leaving and the millennials are coming up and um, the need for leadership skills because the teams you're leading today, you won't have the luxury of being able to be a manager and getting away with that. When you want to be a leader, you're going to have, to, when you want a leadership position, you're going to have to build leadership skills. So, and what I mean by that is a manager can manage a bunch of individual contributors because they manage work. A leader has to bring, um, you know, different disparate groups together to solve complex problems. And as you all know, with companies like the size of Google and LinkedIn and Microsoft and, I, you know, like, you're solving complex, fast-moving problems, and you're serving large markets with micro, um, you know, micro solutions. So you have a, a more, a faster pace, more complex environment. So the the um, the dynamics of the marketplace are growing, and uh, it's really being driven by by you all. We have a question. Hi, Naomi. Um, uh, so thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, so you just mentioned that there are four core members in your company, and one of them happens to be your husband. Um, just out of curiosity, how do you manage this kind of relationship, and what are some advantages and disadvantages that you think this kind of relationship is bringing to your family and your company? That is such a great. I'll have like a whole other talk on what it's like to start a, uh, start off with my husband. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm so problem focused. You know, like in terms of like, okay, I want to solve this problem, so this is the best solution. And I was like, my husband's the best AI guy I know, and he's like amazing. So I want to bring him into the company. So that was a positive. Um, the challenge is that, it, um, and I think actually startup couples is starting to be a lot more common. I've actually heard that that's a thing in in, the, in Silicon Valley these days. Um, maybe because you you can kind of marshal your resources together, but there definitely are drawbacks. Um, one is where did the boundaries end, right? Like, are we ever not working? Um, that's definitely a, a thing. So we really try to make clear boundaries. The other thing is, it turns out that the relationship between um, colleagues is very different than the relationship that you have at work. And that may sound obvious, but um, forgive me for not realizing that when I'm at home, chilling, watching TV, eating dinner, I'm really kind of a chill person. When I'm at work, I am much more type A. And my husband, he's a little bit more similar in both environments. I didn't really realize that I was that different. So it was really me who had to um, kind of gain some uh, uh, self-awareness that like uh, his, his, he had to discover a whole new side of Naomi that was much more, you know, we got to get it done. Here's the next thing to do, like suck it up, uh, whatever. Um, so I can be pretty tough uh, in the workplace. And so I had to learn to um, interact with him in a really professional way. Uh, so just be at my best of uh, professionalism, a meaning like, you know, uh, everybody likes to be treated with dignity and respect. And, it, and, and those doing that in the workplace with him, like it really, I had to be at my absolute best. Um, turned out to be really great for me as a person too, because I've noticed now that I treat my brother better and I treat my mom better. <laughs> so I definitely feel like it's made me a better person um, from, in a family way. But um, yeah, it's, it's, you have to, like in terms of thinking about your risk profile and your, your resources and your family, um, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. So it's, um, it's definitely a, a, a thing to think about, for sure. But you also have a tremendous amount of support and a fantastic partner who is so loyal, right? Um, so that, I think, is really the upside. 
Uh, hi, Naomi. Um, my name is Brandon. I'm a fourth year stats student. Um, I noticed that uh, you switched industries a lot in your career, whether it be from management consulting to media to education. And I've heard that usually when you switch careers, um, you would have to take a lower position. So I have two questions. First is, I'm wondering if you had to take a lower position, and if not, how did you do that? And my second question is, what are your top tips uh, for switching careers? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't think I had to take a lower position. And um, the reason why I have to think about that is they weren't always on the same um, scale, you know? Um, but yeah, like I would say that generally speaking, I was a, I was entering at a high level. Now that being said, I wasn't then um, moving at the trajectory through. Like if you look at my McKinsey colleagues, uh, they were becoming APs or uh, sorry, associate principals or partners, while I was going to Pixar and you know leading production finance. Or um, you know, so there's a there you could say that there's some lateralness there that I chose experience uh, these sort of diverse experiences over um, vertical um, movement. So that's the thing. I don't think I went down though, um, but you know that might be arguable. I uh, my the reason for me that that was so important is um, I was doing this thing of really following my passion. I didn't want to be anywhere if I didn't feel like this was something that I could get up in the morning and be excited about. And it turns out, for me anyway, when I'm bored or not invested, it's not that it's not good. It's like really not good. Like I, I, That's just something that has to do with my personality. I know other people who are really good at being able to say, like, it's just a job. But I'm not like that. So um, so for me, the, the, the skill, it was actually a skill that I picked up, and it is, it's a you know, getting back to it's, these are leadership skills more than anything. And one was being able to um, look at, so at McKinsey, you think about things in uh, vertical lines, like right, in industry, and then functional, like capabilities. So when you think about functional, it's like strategy, finance, operations, organizations. And so I use that or those functional skill sets. And my ability to articulate and think about how I could use that to solve business problems, uh, to basically sell my way into these roles. Uh, and, and so I never had the right resume behind me. But what I did have, uh, one, was being able to show that I could switch gears, because I clearly did from mechanical engineering to management consulting. And then um, from there, being able to take every functional skill that I'd built and say, um, hey, I think I can solve this problem that you have. Uh, with this skill set that I'm bringing in. And the, and the first really big shift I did was to Pixar. And, the, and I had to basically you know, sell them on that, that um, you know, hey, if, if I can figure out how to run a robot, then I can probably figure out your finance spreadsheet. And you know, it's going to be similar. <laughs> um, and you know, whether or not they bought that. But it was basically like that, you know, saying, hey, I can do the math. Um, I think I can understand the organization operation at a, at a certain level because I've done some things that look kind of similar in the world of software development and my management consulting work. And uh, it may not be 100% applicable, but it has some applicability. Um, yeah. um, hi, Naomi. Thanks for coming tonight for uh, sharing your experience with us. I was wondering, who do you see as your uh, biggest competitors in the industry? And what, what, what are your value props that make you different from your competitors? Yeah, biggest competitor. Well, um, so uh, these guys from Siri, and um, uh, they started a company called Ambit IO. Uh, they're also looking at leadership development and uh, measuring the conversation to, um, and they just released a product. And right now, they're struggling with some of the same technology problems we had. So uh, at the moment, um, I'm, I'm looking at them. There's a way that you look at com competition, and you're both like, it's scary, but it's also very validating. Like I'm like awesome. There's some other people proving that this is a real thing. More advanced is in the world of sales conversations. So there's a lot of money in sales. So there's a lot of software that's similar. 
that is being applied to sales skill uh, development. Uh, so ne negotiation, talk time, uh, language use, are you having a pricing or value-based conversation, stuff like that. So it's starting to get quite sophisticated, uh, but it's a really different use case. So I would say for technologically, that's the closest. Uh, and then um, uh, you know, in terms of our use case, Ambit IO is probably uh, the, the nearest buy with a similar kind of technology. Hi. Um, hi, sorry. My name is Ishmael, and um, I'm actually not engineer or business. My major is sociology, cool. fourth year. And um, I'm really interested in entrepreneurship, and I really appreciate you sharing your you know, background and your upbringing, which I you know, share a lot of the similarities with that. Um, I guess a question would be, is like, what would be some advice for someone who's like totally left field, has no experience in like, you know, these hard technical skills or, you know, much experience in business, but's interested in it and wants to really learn? Um, I guess like, you know, something that you would recommend or, you know, a mindset that we should probably carry on. Yeah, um, definitely. First, I would recommend that the mindset's the most important thing. We all start not knowing something like we all and Every successful entrepreneur, one of, the, one of the crazy things about the entrepreneurial path is every time you're successful, you have to learn a whole new skill set. And so if you're not a voracious learner, so first, I hope you're a voracious learner, because if you're a voracious learner, if you love to learn and you, you're curious about things, um, that's the most important skill set you need. And um, so I think that mindset, and then also the mindset, and this is a mistake that I made often, is I would get so focused on growth, I'd forget to recognize what I'm good at. So focus on growth and don't forget what you're good at. And then what I would say is um, in terms of getting the experience, there's, I, I do think it's a special time in the Valley because, in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, because there's so many startups and they're doing so much cool stuff. And there's ton of work to do. So there's always an opportunity to get in and get some really interesting opportunities. Of course, you know, it's going to be competitive at the Googles and the, um, I don't know, Twitters of the world. But there's a lot of really interesting startups that are in these mid sizes at where I think, you know, smaller sizes like Khan Academy, um, how many people there were volunteers and were just jumping in and helping to do something. And um, you know, so it's a great place for that, and you get to see people wearing all kinds of crazy different hats, so you get a lot of exposure. Uh, that's one thing I would recommend. Um, the other thing is, you know, yeah, I, I think actually I'd stay there. I would highly recommend that. And if there's any kind of like entrepreneurial competitions and other things going on at school, also that. Like, I got so much out of the, um, out of doing that and, and meeting, you know, the students who go and take the extra time to do uh, that stuff, they're like equally nerds about this thing. And so you'll meet a lot of like your kindred spirits who you might actually start a startup with. I'm sure classes like this uh, are, are the, you, this community, this network is probably one of the most valuable things in your career. So making sure you get the time to get to know them because you don't have to have all the answers. Uh, that's what your team is for. So. Um, but don't be afraid of getting in there and coding. I bet you'd be great at it. I mean, you know, give it a shot. I'm planning to try to pick up some React, so, um, you know. Hi. Hi. So, I was wondering, uh, when you were talking about creating tribe, you pointed out that there's really two sides that you guys had to work on. One, the actual, like, technological, like, construction of what you're trying to build. But there is also this side of being able to identify what makes a good leader and exactly what behaviors indicate that these users are really starting to fulfill those leadership qualities. So how did you um, get information about that? How did you ac ac uh, access expertise in that area? Yeah, um, it, you know, it's, the, it's an area that is growing. Um, being able to uh, sort of define these more, what feels soft, you know, the, the science of happiness. Um, that's kind of one of the first areas where you start seeing psychology really taking off and looking into these areas that seemed uh, really sort of esoteric. And, um, and from that, a lot of work, especially in the world, uh, I think Google and, uh, was really a leader in this uh, about four or five years ago, seeing if they could measure what made teams successful. Um, so when I, so I took a lot of inspiration from reading, obviously, is what I'm saying. Um, the other thing is um, I did a lot of experimentation with my own teams at LinkedIn and um, you know, started building like surveys 
can you measure um, can you measure objectively whether or not people are good listeners, and how would you measure that? And um, and then can I watch the dynamics of that in an interaction with a team? So um, maybe I'm not answering that great. Is, am I answering your question? But I definitely I started thinking about the frameworks of what are leadership? What are the what are the what are the great coaches of the world say that we should do? Uh, they've got data. They, they may not have captured it in the way that an engineer or scientist would capture it, but they certainly know it well enough to coach the biggest CEOs of the world in successful ways that change their business around. So I took some of the soft stuff, I took some of the hard stuff, and I tried to see if I could figure out um, a framework in between that we could measure and show. Yes, that is uh, a leader with more success. And I know what dyna I know what they're doing, and I can tell you what it is. So that too is largely an experimental process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we still experiment every day. And I know that was definitely, and and this is another reason why um, I didn't want to work with VCs is that was absolutely the harder way to go. Um, but it's the more valuable way to go for when you're trying to solve a problem for people, um, and uh, at least. Most of the VCs in the Valley these days, they're really looking for businesses that are just going to skyrocket and take off like that. And if they invest in an early stage that's really exploring and investing in this kind of science, um, they want these huge percentages of your company. Um, so that's just a little bit of business thing. And I wasn't willing to give up that much of our company. But um, I do think it's the right thing to do to try to figure out what really can we arm people with the knowledge of what leadership, great leadership looks like? And can I actually tell you what you're good at and uh, help you see, benchmark to your peers, where are, where are some of your strengths? And when you want to dial it up, to actually be able to dial it up and see, hey, I'm investing, I'm making a change. Uh, to me, that's like the core of basically operationalizing a growth mindset. Cool. Um, we're gonna end it now, but there'll be people that come up afterwards and have spend a few time, like a few minutes, talking with you and asking questions. Cool. Um, but yeah, let's thank Naomi for awesome uh, talk. <laughs> <laughs>